resonance with that brand when you think about butter right. and what happens is that and it's very contextual right so they'll always make an ad based on what's happening in the world at that point in time it right. is very smartly written it's just a very simple piece of copy right. but in essence they're just a butter brand they're actually nothing else but it means so much more when you think about a brand like that in terms of how much it evokes a feeling it evokes right everyone welcome to our session for podcast for did you fish today um the topic for us is the art of surprise how brands use unexpected marketing techniques or tactics we say i have with me sandeep chon who's a seasoned marketer a mentor and an investor for a lot of startups and of course a growth advisor and a brand person himself So Sandeep I think more than me you will be a better person to give an introduction for yourself so we'll first go um, with an introduction and then we'll hit down on the questions Sure uh thanks Ashmita thanks a lot for having me here uh so I yeah a decade in SaaS in the SaaS world predominantly working for B2B companies prior to that I used to work in sales for a good proportion of my career again in services company so I've been in tech for a good part of my career uh, but my origins don't begin that way I I started off uh, doing engineering uh, working in a manufacturing plant for a couple of years did not like it at all and then at some point decided right. to switch um, so i start from there but my uh, generally my experience i've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity of w- having worked with some great leaders and as a result um, tried and experimented with the different types of st- uh, campaigns in marketing myself um, and also worked with like different sizes of companies from small organizations to mid-sized to large organizations i was very uh, again uh, fortunate enough to work with a company like freshworks to see them at a certain stage of growth and then eventually when we hit ipo at some point today uh, and also having sold to different segments of market to smb customers mid market and in fact my role today i work for a company called prism force we predominantly target tech services company so essentially we're selling to enterprises so uh again uh, great opportunities have been provided over the course of my career so yeah and one thing i think that's always fascinated me is the fact that there's so much you can do with brand there's so much you can do with campaigns and i've learned all of this in the recent past but yeah would love to share more as we chat along perfect so i think coming to our topic because you're a brand person and i believe that i uh, am more in the branding per se as well so i think i'll hit the first question that how do you think that you know brands today are um, kind of surprising the audience and i think audience and that i think that's the need of the hour as well that you know surprise the audience with uh, your uh, advertising tactics or your marketing tactics overall so how do you think that you know people are shifting from the uh, traditional uh, tactics to surprising the consumers in in a way that to grab the maximum attention that they can yeah. what is your actually opinion? to your point I, i i actually wouldn't call myself a brand marketer today i'm trying to get there in fact uh, my origins uh, in marketing itself started in campaigns in field marketing in digital and all of that and it's only like in the recent past that i've realized the importance of taking brand to the forefront because i'm a true believer that brand drives demand uh, right. and i have long discussions with ceos and c level folks i, I mean who are not always for the topic people love brand but is always like hey where's that roi coming from brand but i think to your point uh, it is i think in to, in today's world we're inundated with so much of marketing out there uh, in terms of content in terms of the way things are done and if you look at it right like most folks follow a very similar playbook it's the, almost the same thing across like if you look at and i you see this a lot in saas companies um very similar kinds of design very similar kinds of content very similar kinds of tactics right but there are a few companies that really stand out and i and i honestly i think the biggest leap i always take is from the b2c world i think they have really understood surprise marketing they have really understood how to right. do brand marketing b2b of course fewer companies do it as much um so i feel like it is a greater need today as long as and i'll keep resonating this point today as long as that surprise uh, resonates with your brand and your brand message then yes uh don't do it for the sake of gimmicks because gimmicks don't always work they only work with a very small segment of market uh, but i think it is in today's uh, world of too much of everything too much of content in whatever platform you take i think those moments of surprise uh, are always good for your consumer and i think the best examples in the world today are in the b2c market and i'll talk about it today as well i think there are a couple of examples I've written down 
um, yeah. who I think all of us, in, especially folks like me in B2B, need to look at that and try to emulate some of those ideas. But yeah. Right. Uh, so, Sandeep, for me, for example, I've been more than a decade uh, purely into the branding sector. And um, when it comes to campaigns, yes, of course, everybody, I believe what you're saying, that, you know, everybody at the end of the day, okay, branding is one part of it, but where is the ROI coming from? Where is the money coming from? So uh, it becomes a little difficult for brand marketers to actually make a, a balance for brands where, um, you know, we take care of the branding per se, as well as we're getting the ROI sorted as well. And there, there is always a clash between both of them because uh, branding purely depends on how you would want, you know, to kind of communicate to users, your content strategy, your competition uh, analysis, etc. But when it comes to ROI, it's typically based on campaigns and how your consumers are reciprocating to it. So um, for me personally, when we talk about, we've, you know, we've kind of worked with the FMCG sector, we've worked with fintech clients, we've worked with SaaS clients, we've worked with um, a lot of technology partners as well, where we're taking care of their branding and campaigning bit as well. But, you know, narrowing it down to a couple of examples, which I think you can take a lead on, where, where do you think that, you know, um, when we're talking about consumer driven approach, um, is taking us today where we're saying not just surprising the consumers, but also giving them something which is more, uh, you know, consumable or which is more respected when it comes to uh, them using it. How do you really think that the brands are shaping up with that and not just purely thinking of the ROI perspective, but also uh, getting into the consumers for a longer term? Yeah. I'll talk one very classic example. All of us, especially in India, will relate to this um, in terms of how a brand can drive emotion for you. Uh, Amul, Amul's ads, right? Like Amul, if for all practical people at the international audience listening in, Amul essentially is a butter brand. Uh, they sell products like that. Just imagine it's just pure play butter brand. I wish I could show a visual. But uh, the quirky ads, and it's all, essentially, most of this is all print media. They don't do anything else. There's, there's no, I've never seen an Amul ad. I don't think I ever have. But there's a resonance with that brand when you think about butter. Right. And what happens is that and it's very contextual, right? So they'll always make an ad based on what's happening in the world at that point in time. It right. is very smartly written. It's just a very simple piece of copy. Right. But in, in essence, they're just a butter brand. They're actually nothing else. But it means so much more when you think about a brand like that in terms of how much it evokes a feeling it evokes, right? I haven't seen, I, I think B2B brands try a lot to try to create a very emotional value attached to their brand or their product. It is hard. It's not easy. Uh, large B2B, uh, B2B SaaS, on the other hand, another extreme where we are always trying to like, hey, can we drive emotion from something? It's very hard to drive emotion from a specific brand, right? I think um, I'll, I'll quote my one of my previous companies, Freshworks did a very good job in that, right? So I think one of the, uh, I think it still exists as a tagline for what Freshworks products do. Essentially, they are, they say, delight made easy. Uh, that's a that's a tagline of what they do. Why? Because Freshworks today caters to customer support executives, internal IT executives. And for them, customer delight is the main thing that their end customer sort of solves for. Freshworks products help them get there, right? So just that, the, the way they've sort of changed that whole narrative. But I feel like uh, a lot of the times it's about how you create that emotional value attached to the brand that can be. And I think Right. To me, the best example has always been when I talk to people, it's always been Amul. Um, right. I'm like, just it's a butter brand, but this butter brand has made such an impact to people's lives. Right. When you look at it, you always smile. There's always a genuine smile out of a reaction to that. I think another closer brand, to my knowledge, if I remember top, is Cadbury's. Um, right. Watch Cadbury's ads. Um, right. Typically, it's again. Awesome. You know, great they always do something i mean there are a lot of other chocolate brands of course doing some really good ads no doubt about it but there's something emotionally attached to a right. to a it's really surprising it's, it's chocolate chocolate's making supposed to make you feel happy uh that's that's a typical thing that we would associate a, a, a sort of a fmcg product like that but these folks just make it so much uh better in terms of how they i i, I don't personally i like i only eat dark chocolate but it, when I think about my only go-to thing is like, hey, where's the Cadbury's dark chocolate? Let me just pick that up because of that resonance of brand. And I feel like there's a need to create those experiences, those emotional moments, wherever you can. It's I think it it, it resonates a lot with B2C. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen B2B. Okay, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, right? So uh, uh, around me is just a whole host of Apple products. Uh, now, now, I, I mean... I. People have always asked me in my time, like, why do you spend so much? Yeah, this Android product is far better. I agree. Like, technically, technically, they probably are superior phones themselves. Right. But there is something about this brand. Uh, just, I mean, of course, user experience. I, I haven't seen too many products that have beaten them. 
Um, but there's something about this an emotional attachment to this brand as well, like in terms of how they position themselves. They don't even tell you that. They just say like, hey, in fact, the recent ad is like something, uh, uh, a product that's in space or a, they right. built something out of titanium. I think the the i4, uh, the 14, uh, the 15, 15, if I remember right. That 15, yeah. Right. So I think this, uh, some, and, and again, this is Apple that's created this over decades, right? It's not something that's just happened. It's when you want to create an emotional, emotional connect, I think it comes to that. So I feel like, um, when brands should think about the surprise element that they can bring, even if it's a, a, a simple enough product, I think you have an opportunity there. Customers will resonate, will attach themselves to the brand eventually. Right. I think when it comes to, uh, you know, marketing it or putting it across, right, even, uh, you know, our social media domains such as Facebook or LinkedIn or um, X or Instagram have been marketing themselves as well. And when it comes to uh, B2B marketing or a B2C marketing, both have been beautifully taken care of by these social platforms who, uh, if we as layman think, they don't really need advertising because we're all on it. So, but even they are spending huge amount of budgets in terms of advertising uh, for the B2B audience as well. So that's where their branding uh, mechanism also takes place. And coming to one of your examples, when it comes to B2C, um, during COVID-19, Pepsi also came up with a beautiful ad campaign, uh, you know, which typically spoke about um, it, it's not uh, local for the local vendors, you know, that celebrate Diwali with the local vendors. Cadbury came up with the same thing. Pepsi came up with the same thing where, you know, they had the avatar of Shah Rukh Khan speaking about the local vendor. So where AI also came in. So all that is marketing. All that is the techniques that our uh, marketers are, you know, profoundly going out, out loud and talking about. So coming to that, how do you really think the psychology of the consumers is um, reacting to if they see a surprise element in the overall marketing strategy? How do you really think the psychology of consumers have changed um, from a traditional mode to this kind of a marketing technique as well? I think it will create some, as I said, it will create some kind of emotional response to um, whatever they're looking at, right? Like, I feel like there's definitely value to be had if you are going to try and surprise your uh, end customer. Okay. And I've always seen that, again, it doesn't, again, I'll also be clear, some, it doesn't always work. Uh, if you stay away from your core brand messaging or what you represent and just take, hey, come on, I'm just going to do something really wild out there and expect the audience to react. They may not, right? right. Some, sometimes it's it's also very, and I find this also tricky, right? It's sometimes very hard to know, will they truly react to this kind of a gimmick or not? Uh, there are certain things you can always try and do, but it's not always that they will react. So I, I, to your point, yes, there is a there is a psychological aspect to, uh, to the fact that it is there. Suddenly they connect to the brand. They, they won't even know why they're connecting to the brand. It's just like, hey, there's something that drew them towards that. We, there's a lot of clear experiences in the B2C world to call that out because these are consumer products. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to think of are there B2B examples? I mean, I'll, I'll leave the apples of the world aside, but are there other brands that you feel drawn towards? Um, I'm not thinking of too many. Uh, like as an as a like I love this. See, for example, as a marketer, uh, there are a few brands personally I'm drawn towards just the way. They position themselves on, I'll call them out, right? Like, for example, of course, my previous organization, Freshworks, um, is a brand I'm drawn towards. Um, in fact, there are, there are a few other companies. There's a company called Paper Flight. Uh, some folks might know. Essentially, they're a platform that helps you build content. They can, you can house content. Now, why I like Paper Flight is just the way they, they visually represent themselves on social. It's so beautiful. It's very unique from everything that I have seen in the recent past. Another company I, I sort of like a lot is Rocket Lane. Um, I know these folks essentially on the customer onboarding space. Why they look good, everything about them is, is so media friendly in terms of, for example, they've recently started something called Rocket Lane TV. Uh, so it's like it's an online, almost like a Netflix version of customer onboarding and people can go and house their content and listen to a lot of stuff. So I feel like there are a lot of brands like these. Uh, I mean, I am a loyalist when it comes to them in terms of like, I, I watch them keenly as a marketer to see, can I get inspired by something that these folks are doing? But it's sure for me, like when I see a, when I see something that they do, it it makes me smile, right? Like even though I'm not in, maybe I'm potential customer of paper flight, but at the moment, maybe not something for Rocket Lane. But so eventually I feel like these brands are drawn to, even in the B2B world, right? I feel like some of these brands, these are just names I can think of who I feel like just doing those small, small things can create an emotional response. If right. not today, then at some point, we'll probably work together. Right. Makes sense. 
So, you know, you just spoke about that there is a risk element as well when you're talking about marketing, you know, a consumer or people might like it or they do not like it. Do you really think, do you really have uh, an idea that, you know, how do marketers, for example, we've been marketers uh, from a while now, there is there is a responsibility of striking the li- right balance, uh, you know, in terms of uh, whether it's going to be taken correctly or not, the brand positioning needs to be right, the communication needs to be right. So um, according to you, what is the kind of, you know, striking the balance note for a marketer to give it to the brand? I feel like, as I said, no, you, you gotta, uh, you, you need to know what your brand message is or what your brand identity is and whatever you're building, try to sort of fill in that world. Right. Sometimes you'll have to take risks with that, right? Sometimes it doesn't always work. And to me, the, the best example, I don't know if you recall, uh, again, B2C brand Tanish came out with this remarriage, uh, I think, tagline that they came out. There was a, there was a whole campaign that they ran for. Right. I loved the campaign. I loved how, what it was trying to do, like trying to address the very progressive Indian buyer today. Now that campaign, uh, to me, it, 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 I mean, if I looked at the larger picture and if I go and check out the comments that I saw on Twitter and all of that, it did give some mileage for the brand for sure. Uh, I mean, of course, whether it's famous or infamous, it doesn't matter. But there was an, a sort of a divide between what people felt as it resonated uh, with the community or with the local, with the, uh, our sort of strata of society, right? So I feel like uh, you have to take a call as a, as, a, as a brand leader, as a brand marketer, as a C-level person within the organization. Right. How much are you willing to push that message? How close are you going to keep it to the point of what will happen, right? So this was a, this was a very difficult example because it was like, I, to, to me, it worked. But it's not the same for everyone else. Um, right. Some people, one segment of audience did not believe it worked, right? So I think you have to take those those small risks also. And I feel, I also feel sometimes brands don't take those risks. I mean, you don't have to go 360 to the other end and do something right. completely outrageous. Mm. But this was not a bad idea at all. I think the idea was very, very, uh, a very good idea considering where we are in society. How And India is a progressive country, no matter what we think. Right. Um, and I feel like it was trying to address that, but hey, it, it didn't, doesn't always work sometimes. Right. Um, Sandeep, as marketers, I'm sure you've seen the kind of shift of people from one domain to the other when it comes to uh, advertising. For example, we were restricted to uh, a traditional at a certain stage and then electric, uh, you know, then the television came into picture. Then now we have social media, which uh, within, you know, within seconds, things can go either viral or they can absolutely collapse. So how do you think that, you know, if we're talking about content online and offline, how do you kind of strike that balance for a brand where you say um, that, you know, nothing's going to go wrong and things are going to be okay when it comes to a social media campaign or, uh, you know, your advertising campaign otherwise? How do you really strike that balance and how do you really think that people will take that uh, as consumers? As you rightly just gave an example about one of the campaigns. Might be we as marketers because we know that what is the kind of work that has gone into it and what is the impact it creates. Yeah. But I'm sure there's something good or bad at anything that you kind of do. So, um, sure. how do you really think that social media is making things change, making the consumer's mindset change, and as well as the brands change uh, in terms of how do they market? I think um, social media, for better or worse, gives brand feedback really fast. Right. Um, in the past, you, we, when we didn't have social media, it was to be like television or like movie cinema theaters or billboards. And right. you get that information like over time, right? You'll know whether a brand or a message is like, today you put out an ad on social media, like within seconds, some person is retweeting, tweeting, and everyone has some spiel about what they believe is the right thing for that brand. And the the feedback, again, it's also dependent on companies, how seriously they take some of that. Like a lot of it could be just trolls just having a ball of a time but um you got to take so i think feedback is almost instantaneous when you hit something on social um that's the opportunity at the same time if it works really well the virality of something just picks off and just it goes into multi without even you knowing it like before you even get up and you see something it's gone like wow like i it was trending on like top three or whatever on twitter or any of the other social handles so I think there's both positive and negative impact to what social can do for brands. Um, but I think the, uh, brands are also beginning to realize that each platform works slightly differently. The formats, of course, work differently, right? But what you run on an Inst- the themes, of course, are the same. But what kind of ad you run on Instagram versus a Twitter versus a Facebook, obviously, will be slightly different from each other. There is some level of demographic to consider as well uh, in terms of what group of audience will be on a Facebook like. My generation is very Facebook friendly and 
I use Twitter nowadays a lot more, not than I used to before. Instagram hardly like occasionally put pictures versus a generation before me um, is probably less Facebook friendly, more Insta friendly. So it totally depends on what segment. So I feel like audiences, I mean, brands today, of course, do that very well. Uh, but I think your point, feedback is almost instantaneous, uh, which is both good and scary for brands. Right. So I think on that note, why don't we kind of give an example, uh, you know, if you're talking about a brand going viral in a good or a bad way, if you could just give a little, um, you know, snippet in terms of certain examples or certain brands that you've worked with or you know, uh, you know, who have made good or bad because of uh, social media. I can give you my previous organization, right? Like there were a couple of campaigns that we tried um, and one of them, like we, we, we planned, I'll, I'll even call out the campaign. Right? So there was a, if I remember right, there was, um, so I, again, I was, I was also responsible for this. So we created a camp, uh, an event called Outsell, which is essentially a virtual event at that point in time. I had managed to get some really good speakers for the event in my segment, of course, great sales leaders who you typically not easily get. So I reached out to them. They were very uh, forthcoming. They came in and I was like, this is the first big thing I really want to do when I was, I was recently joined the company, company uh, I used to work before called Outplay. I was so gung-ho about the whole thing because we, we had the best speakers. We had the best everything. We literally did everything, right? We thought, okay, we've got all of this, this kind of muscle, uh, some really smart folks in it. And it's got a great, Outsell is a good name, I felt like for right. all salespeople, right. how to outsell, associate with the brand, associate with our products for Outplay. So right. went full gung-ho with the whole approach. It's okay, yeah, it'll catch fire. People on LinkedIn will start talking about it, sharing about it. It just bombed, right? It, it totally bombed. Like there's nothing, there was... I mean, I couldn't find, I mean, eventually we kind of figured that it possibly one of the reasons, we, I'll tell you what the reason is possibly. So we did everything possible to try and get people to come and be interested in something like that, right? We had, and typically they say for an event like this, you got to have good speakers, you got to have good content, the titles should work. It checked all those boxes. It didn't have, like I had a checklist that didn't have anything and, and we could put some money here and try to do some ads here. Um, eventually, of course, the thing is, as you said, right, the, the, the first point that you mentioned, the fact that this, um, uh, there was just way too many webinars, events happening at that time, right? I think people had, have, are always fed up of like, so even though I had really good, so what happened eventually from that event is that content, we used it in different forms, like writing blogs and YouTube videos. Later on, it picked up like oh, six months after the event sort of worked. That right. content was really working. We were getting people to come up and talk about the product. But when we did it, it was such a downer because it was like, hey, we, we thought we did everything right. We ran some interesting, fun campaigns on social. It just bombed. Right? Right. Versus, uh, if I remember right, so we did another campaign, uh, a very popular campaign called uh, the Call of Fame campaign. Um, now, this campaign, I'll give you what the context of this campaign essentially was. Um, we had called recordings. So typically when you're doing a sales role, one of the things that you, uh, you'll, you'll try to good, write good emails, you'll want to write good LinkedIn messages, you want to improve your calling ability, right. but you never get to listen to call recordings of actual calls trying to, for people to pitch. You'll right. typically hear that from your company. So we have some recording software like Gong or whatever, you listen to that, you will get better. Mm -hmm. So we found calls, we asked people, again, this was all, we voluntarily asked people to submit calls to us and tell, hey, do you want to like, uh, we're going to open up this public domain thing. Anybody can listen to anyone's calls. Just help salespeople get better. Because no matter what you see in a calling script, right. actually doing a call is a whole different thing, right? I need to listen to different, like a live call. It caught like crazy virality. People were sharing it, random people, sales world. And we, we thought, okay, just, we'll just put the word out there. We'll get a feeler for what it is, right? And we also knew it would be had. I mean, it's not like we didn't know it will take off. We just didn't know how big it will become because for us, it was it, an asset like this never existed. Nothing like this existed in the past in a public domain. Um, and it picked off, right? So you can never truly say what's going to catch fire versus what's not going to catch fire, no matter if you check all the boxes here. We, and this one, we probably had a five list check sheet. And the other one, I probably had 50 line items that I was trying to do. Um, I would if you ask me to do it again. I do it again. I might just think about the timing of how I would do it. Um, but yeah, these are like quick learnings of what I thought, at least my example of something that I'd seen or been involved in where something just totally didn't work at all when you did everything right. And once something you didn't go crazy in terms of how you were doing it, but then it just took off.
So, Sudeep, for you as a marketer, what do you think and what will you suggest, uh, you know, a couple of key elements that you think uh, people should follow to make a successful um, campaign overall and get that attention that they desire? One, of course, that you, you know, you mentioned earlier is the timing. It needs to be, you know, yeah. having the right time overall. Even yeah, yeah you got you to... I'll give you a, before I even answer that, I'll give you a, the craziest event I've ever, virtual event I've ever attended. And uh, it's a company that still exists today. It's a company called Terminus. They're an ABM platform. Okay. Um, the event, I don't know if you have to censor this, but the event is called, event was called Break Shit. That okay. was the event. Okay. The title of the event. Right? And I'm like, so I'm curious about ABM platform because as a marketer, I'm interested in like what is like how much you can do in an ABM right. method and what does a platform do? So I just signed up and this was like in the US time zone. So it was um, probably 11 p.m. my time, our time in India. Okay. Um, I joined in, I signed up to the, signed up that thing. And they, they had six or seven marketers. The event was only the six or seven marketers. Each of them had to answer one question and the entire event was that. And while they were answering the question, they would take and they would break stuff. They okay. would break, like actually break like that, ex the event itself, like I went and was waiting 20 minutes to enter the event because I was so curious to see what this event was about. But I feel like just like this threw something completely out of the other end, which is quite fascinating for me. Um, so I think just one big example. So as a marketer, don't restrict to the playbooks that always exist. I think uh, look beyond it sometimes because it might, something different might work. For, don't go do different for the sake of doing different. But don't always copy everything that's available online as well. Um, sometimes it might not always work with your audience. Like really go down to understanding. I think the first rule of anything is understand whom you're selling to, the ICP, ideal customer profile well, and then build things around that, whatever brand initiatives, anything you can do around that. Right? You can have, of course, use checklists, use all kinds of things to make sure you do everything to promote it. But if you don't understand who your buyer is really, uh, then you're going to struggle. Uh, it'll, it'll always be a, a, a chance, right? And one advice that always, quick advice that I always tell people is that build MVP versions of your campaign, like uh, a minimum viable product. They do it for products when they build products. Yeah. Do it for a campaign also. Like yeah. do a small tester and see if there's a little bit of fire that's coming or run that idea by a few other people outside your firm and see in that, in that audience, of course, and yeah. see if that works, right? And if you're getting a little bit of, oh, okay, this suddenly become interesting for them, then you know you're on to something, right? So uh, don't be hesitant to try if you can. Sometimes you always you don't always uh, cannot do that, but when you can, try and do it. Yeah. Okay. So Sandeep, you have been a guide, a mentor to a lot of startup ecosystem, and uh, as far as I noticed, that there is a lot of uh, you know brand shift that's happening with consumers also today. Um, for example, if we talk about in the B two C sector, people are shifting from bigger brands to homegrown products or you know uh, natural Ayurvedic etc. So there are products up some uh, you know in in these sectors. So do you really think that you know having a, a giant in the ecosystem along with the few uh, startups who have just come up and I'm sure they have brilliant products? How do you really think that marketing them differently from what the these giants are doing uh, will be impacting them because uh, these newbies, these startups do try every point in terms of marketing, having high spend sometimes, um, in terms of their ad spend, having a brilliant brand strategy, having amazing um, uh, you know, campaign, having um, Amazon tie-ups to sell their products, having brand ambassadors coming for them. But nothing really works out because they there are huge joints in the same sector. How do you as marketer think that you know we um, you know who can support startups have a strategy which people really understand and would want to try their products? It's it's majorly there, I think, in the FMCG uh, genre that you know people are really hesitant to uh, try new products, but there are brands coming up with brilliant products better than what the giants are actually catering because. Yeah. Uh, I believe when they have to grow volume somewhere or the other, we do kind of, uh, you know, uh, plunge upon our uh, basic uh, ethical methods of producing that, right? So yeah. how do you really think that for the startup ecosystem, um, they can have a little bit in terms of a difference in terms of marketing when they are portraying themselves? Yeah, I think to your point, right, like there'll always be competition to anything that you build. Right. So always keep that in mind, but don't always get, sometimes if there is a lot of, uh, there is good enough competition in your area, means that there is an existing demand. That's also a right. good thing. It's not a bad thing at all, right? To enter a space. But actually the example, your question is so timely because I was recently listening to a podcast about, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, the bike Ether. 
the yeah. electric ev vehicle right ether. so the context is um, ether 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 i'm not sure how they pronounce it but the context is e E, the EV vehicle Aether uh, entered the market or continues to enter, enter the market where whilst there were at least four or five manufacturers of Aether mm. who were trying to sell the bike at almost lesser cost. Right. Some of them were shipped from China and all of that stuff. Mm. Aether, now is, I think is still only the fourth in terms of market share that they have today in the market, mm. but is easily one of the, and one of the reasons they are the fourth today is only because of the fact that there are giants much bigger than them who are trying to put marketing muscle but right. if you generally try and get a sense of which is a more preferred brand, mm -hmm. it's Ether. When you typically look at that EV vehicle, if you ask someone, hey, EV means go try that Ether, man. That's like the, the best vehicle that's probably there to go out. And why, right? The two things that, and I, I heard this again from the podcast, this, the founder himself was talking about it. There are two aspects of it. One is the design. And it's not even like, not even a price thing here. It was not a case that the bike was cheaper. It was not cheaper. It was mm -hmm. definitely on par or even more than your typical vehicles. Um, Two things is they focused on performance and they focus on design. Like it's a very unique bike. It's not something you'd see. It looks like you look at it like, oh, what is this? Something different. Right. Um, and they focused on performance, right? It was a much powerful engine, the, the way they built. And this is what they wanted to do. And in fact, he said the ethos of the company is don't build something that you yourself don't like. Don't just always go with what the consumer is sometimes saying. And, and in a nutshell, to kind of put that together, if I had to quickly summarize, Focus on product. Like you said, if your product is definitely better than the competition, even right. if it's a much larger player, don't right. worry about it. Just focus on product and then find ways to evangelize the world about this good. Because see, um, Airbnb, again, another conversation. I think this founder talks about how it's good to have 100 customers who love your brand versus having, let's say, 10,000 customers who are okay with your product. Right. Who are like, Achalta, like, I'm okay with this. Versus 100 people who love your brand and this 100 people will tell 100 other people and that's how it goes, right? So uh, even if you're building, build small, build great product, build great experiences so that even if the few, few of them are there, trust those few to go and be your evangelist for the future. You can save up on marketing budget significantly. So eventually, I think just build good products, focus on those first set of customers, build your customer base and then go from there. But you really need, I think there's no substitute, especially in the tech world, for good products, uh, no different, no thing. I mean, you can try and do go with the price war. You can try all of that stuff. The gimmicks of the world do exist. A lot of companies thrive on that stuff. But no, um, end of the day, you'll you'll have loyal customers. Only the product is great. The experience is great. They will always come back and they will talk about your product in hundred other places. And that's all you want. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Um. So. You know, queuing with that, what you just said, um, Sandeep, how do you really think that, you know, people are trying unexpected ways of marketing as well, you know, unexpected in terms of uh, that today there is a competition, you know, when, for example, Starbucks came to India, there was uh, a huge competition that came in, for example, Costa Coffee Day, everything, just baristas of um, India actually made sure that, you know, when Tata is getting Starbucks, there is something about it. And then, you know, it, you talk about pricing, you talk about a campaign, everything varies from consumer to consumer everybody cannot really afford um, a coffee of starbucks but people were really affording the coffee of a coffee day or a you know a barista so the, the price difference was there so how do you really think that you know when there is a competition that comes in the market what is the kind of campaigning strategy the existing brands should take to kind of overpower themselves where um you know if not the audience shift happens but they retain uh, at the end of the day to their current uh, used products. Yeah. Uh, I think just stay true to who you are as a brand. Like, doesn't matter. Like, you'll always say, you'll always get competitive. I'll give the coffee example, which is perfect. So in Bangalore, in our office, um, I think we, we context, uh, it's an HSR layout. HSR has got like tons of cafes. Yeah, there's like a lot in Bangalore. There's several cafes one can walk on to. I forget the name of this brand. But it's a very local, local setup brand. Um, they serve great filter coffee. There's I love filter coffee. There's a bunch of tea and there's a whole bunch of outfits. And I got down, we want to have a cup of coffee. And my name, my person's uh, a colleague of mine said, Hey, let's just go to this cafe. I'm like, what is this? Everyone's here. And it's always crowded. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not the most fancy place in the world. It's always and why I said because it, not that it's the the coffee is the I mean, good enough price, it's slightly expensive than let's say a roadside shop, for example but not as expensive as, let's say, a Starbucks, right. but just great quality coffee, great quality beverage, right? And I think 
if you continue to do great quality things, as I said the previous statement as well, may have hundred good customers. That's all. Make mm-hmm. don't compromise on quality just because you want to try to serve the mass. Yeah. Uh, don't compromise on experience if you want to serve the mass. Right? Uh, you will always lose. Right? Uh, you'll, you'll continue. Yes, you will lose some part of market share in that process of competition entering. No doubt about it. But you'll eventually get loyalists that your competition will eventually lose because their if their product is not on par or better, you'll always and there'll always be a market for uh, let's say a local coffee house versus a Starbucks. Right? That's a different audience and versus this is a different audience. Right? So I feel like there's always uh, there's opportunity there. So stick to your who you are. Focus on product. Focus on experience. You'll get there. Perfect, perfect. So, uh, indeed, it was an insightful uh, session, Sandeep. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we value the examples that you shared with us, the uh, learnings that you shared with us, and the elements that you shared in terms of to become uh, a key marketer when it comes to any uh, brands that somebody is catering. Thank you so much for staying with us for any further sessions if required by the audience. And it will be great to be connected. Uh, thanks once, once again, Ashmita, and thank you all for joining. Uh, it was generally very con- unconventional. Generally, I get called on to talk about GTM growth and <laughs> tactics, and that stuff. It was a lot of fun to reflect on brand, something I'm truly passionate about nowadays. So thanks for having me over. Thank you so much, Sandeep. Thank you for your time.